Uh, hello everyone, uh, thanks for joining this webinar. This is actually the second time we've presented, uh, or the first time as part of the Oracle Application User Group for this particular Brexit webinar. Um, and also, uh, more specifically, uh, as part of the, uh, the Tax Management Special Interest Group that I currently chair. So we try and do uh, quite a few webinars throughout the year. Um, but this is actually the last educational series for the year. So I'm not sure if I get an award for that, Colin. If I, I wanted to uh, ideally provide um, a slightly different perspective on Brexit um, that would hopefully shed a different light on things around indirect tax and more importantly indirect tax in Oracle, which is what we're Innovate Tax specialising of course and uh, what we try and do in terms of providing help via the Oracle Tax Management Special Interest Group. Um, so the introduction, um, what we're going to talk about is um, uh, Brexit, of course, and its impacts. Uh, for those of you that don't know Brexit, I'm assuming you do because that's the reason why you're on this, but Brexit is the, um, it was a vote, a referendum in the UK uh, for the UK to leave the European Union. Um, and uh, it hasn't been a vote at this point yet. But uh, we're likely to, or hopefully, be leaving within uh, the next two years. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, uh, part of um, the Oracle Application User Group e-learning, uh, and it will actually be available to view at a, a later date as well. Okay. So whether you voted uh, in or out, um, So I apologise, uh, just just checking the slide there. Um, something but actually a bit about myself and the company I work for. So actually Innovate Tax are actually the uh, largest and most experienced specialist Oracle Innovate Tax uh, consultancy anywhere globally. Um, you may think that's uh, that will go to one of the big four, but it doesn't. Um, they're, they're quite segregated uh, when it comes to their, their teams. Um, we only work with Oracle applications and that's really important. Um, so that means that we focus on Oracle. There's no uh, hidden agenda with regards to the solutions that we that we work with and the answers we give. It's all about providing maximum maximum information to uh, the users out there. Um, and we were multi award winning as well. We won the uh, European Innovator of the Year uh, this year, which we're quite proud of. Myself, uh, I'm currently chair of the Oracle Tax Management Special Interest Group. Um, we've actually won uh, two distinction awards over the last three years, which we're quite proud of. Um, and that's for the, the work that we are doing around um, providing information on webinars like this so that people are more aware of uh, how good the EB tax module actually is. Um, and I've been doing Oracle for about 20 years now. So the agenda, what we're going to do, quick Brexit summary, uh, tax related. Um, the impact on indirect tax, timings and configuration in terms of uh, how Brexit may uh, uh, impact things. Um, some of the HMRC changes, so obviously uh, focus on HMRC because on the European Union side nothing should really change, it's just a country dropping out of its uh, circle so to speak and be treated just like Norway or Switzerland. Uh, and then we'll have a, a little chat about the compliance afterwards as well. So whether you voted in or out, uh, or didn't vote at all, so uh, even though some of you may be in the US you may have had the uh, ability to vote if you have residency etc. Um, I think it's clear that there's been much negative reaction um, to the referendum result on 25th of June. Um, much in the same way that you guys have uh, had quite a bit of negative reaction with your uh, incoming president, Mr. Trump. Um, I think a lot of people have their own opinions, uh, what they think may be doom and gloom, um, could actually turn out to be something positive. Not, not in every aspect, but um, like with everything else, you would hope that, um, you know, when... when a country goes through a change as big as this, that people will look to, to come out um, and make sure things are positive for that country. Um, so how does this affect you or how does it affect your company around uh, Oracle specifically and indirect tax? Um, but first let's have a quick overview of some of the bigger or the larger impacts. Um, about a month ago I was actually at a, a, an event where the MP, John Barron, who's actually been quite uh, influential around the whole uh, Brexit process, and he was speaking on Brexit a a as a whole, so not on indirect tax, but just as Brexit on the whole. And his suggestion is that much of the negative reaction and concerns that we have experienced are overplayed. 
and there are much bigger issues globally that we should be concerned about. And of course, we have to look at the media and how they would jump on things and twist things. Um, some will, will uh, highlight uh, what is really sort of negative, and some will highlight what is really positive. But generally, the media is out there to, to sell uh, news, and as a result, they will jump on things and potentially blow things out of control. So, some of the points to consider. Um, According to the Prime Minister, Brexit means Brexit. Or does it, uh, as my title says there. Um, it's been made clear with the recent court ruling to allow MPs to vote on whether uh, or when if Article 50 can be a vote. So at the moment, uh, we're going through the court, the Supreme Court, to find out what will actually happen and see if MPs have any deciding uh, say. Um, so that could delay things, so, so we don't know. We've, one of the problems with, uh, with the markets, of course, is that they do not like uncertainty and we have a whole load of uncertainty with, with the whole Brexit situation. Um, but whatever happens, the UK will want to remain a positive, uh, or sorry, will, will want to have a positive relationship to continue with Europe, um, which of course we're still a member. Um, it, we're just leaving the European Union and we're not uh, creating a, a new continent. So we are definitely part of Europe. Um, the UK is still the fifth largest economy in the world. I mean, maybe with the, uh, the new currency ratings, we may have slipped down to sixth, but I think technically we're still the fifth largest economy in the world and with a trade def deficit with the EU. So it's highly unlikely that we'll see any punitive tariffs, especially as the World Trade Organization only allows tariffs averaging, I think, between 3 to 5%. Um, and Germany, especially, who pretty much uh, run Europe, uh, would, have it, would find it very hard. Um, should these punitive damages be introduced because they would be in both directions and of course Germany has a, 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 a huge um, or we rather we have a, a big deficit with Europe as a whole and particularly with Germany so it would, it would impact the German economy if uh, there were lots of tariffs. Um, the other interesting thing as well is that with Mr Trump now taking over the most powerful seat on the planet um, he was a fan of Brexit and he may actually see preferential treatment from the, uh, uh, you know, towards uh, uh, the UK to help us out in effect or with the trade agreements. Uh, and um, as we're already seeing with some of the Commonwealth countries, such as Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, for example, I'm quite happy to look at how they can uh, establish better trade deals uh, and more freely with the UK after Brexit. Um, interestingly, after leaving the EU, the UK will have its own seat at the World Trade Organization. So we may even have more influence uh, around that. And I think something that certainly came out uh, with the Brexit was how uh, slow um, Europe is in pretty much anything. It's very bureaucratic. And I think um, uh, having um, or, or being outside of Europe will potentially allow things to speed up. Um, but something that is very likely is that Brexit's highly likely to bring free movement of goods to an end. So this means no more heading to France to stock up on wine and bring back uh, tons of uh, booze without taxation, as the taxes most affected will be customs and excise duties. So no more booze cruises for those of you um, who are in the UK. So, okay. Um, what does this actually mean for indirect tax? Okay, so interestingly, for HMRC, it's a good thing, as there is now lots of opportunity for change. Hopefully they won't go for that opportunity, but there is opportunity for change. But this risk of change for those registered for VAT, i.e. the taxpayer, is not good. So it's good for HMRC, uh, not good for uh, companies that are registered. And I think that goes uh, also potentially for um, International firms that, of course, have uh, registered for Moss in the UK, they would have to change that out. Ireland is is, is looking the most uh, obvious choice, being an English speech English speaking country, uh, and there's also a lot of international companies already headquartered there as well. The EU guidelines ensure that all members uh, stuck to the laws that are designed to make things easier, and many challenges or suggested changes that often came from the UK have been rejected. So currently the EU can stop Parliament from adopting new rules, um, and that's the UK Parliament. Um, but of course this will cease to exist. So without the EU, HMRC would be free to make changes as they see fit. There's even a risk that an outgoing government may make changes to VAT, either with the rates or the process that they know could cause annoyance uh, that will come under any um, incoming government. So, uh, you know, or to gain favour. 
So, for example, dropping tax rates or increasing tax rates, um, you know, not necessarily for the benefit of the economy, but potentially to, to um, you know, from a political gain. Um, hopefully you won't see this, but this is another area to consider that having a solution that is well structured and maintained will give you a security knowledge that your solution will be able to uh, easily adopt any changes. So, um, you know, it's very unlikely. If you look at the uh, all the GST and VAT countries around the world, you don't see them chopping and changing tax rates as, as they please. It's uh, far more unlikely. So we, we tend to think that the, the UK would be very, very, very similar. Um, the UK will no longer be constrained by the EU VAT directive on setting its VAT rates or even using VAT anymore. I mean, technically, you could change the GST or sales and use tax. Very, very unlikely to happen. Um, so assume that VAT is going to stay. Um, EU law states that VAT will be transactional based. Um, and it's uh, used by the UK could change this to sales tax, as I mentioned. And this is highly unlikely, as all of the hundreds of countries that have adopted uh, VAT over the, uh, the last sort of 40 years, I think only Belize was ever to revert back to a sales tax. Um, Puerto Rico went to go to VAT, but it didn't actually happen. So they never actually made the change in the first place. The current EU rules are a minimum 15% standard rate and a maximum 25%. Uh, and then you only have, or meant to have, two reduced rates, which must be 5% or higher. Um, but Ireland uh, and France already have three reduced rates. Um, Hungary has uh, a 27% standard rate. So, um, you know, which I think is, is typical with many European countries, they will uh, ignore the rules that they want to because one of the issues with the European Union is there is no penalty or consequence for doing things wrong, um, as we have seen. Uh, so um, where we've got countries that should be sticking to just two reduced rates in actual fact, you know, that, that with, with France, for example, with three, Ireland with three, um, the UK would be in its rights to introduce more taxes. Um, but if we look at countries like New Zealand or Latvia, where you've got far more simple uh, tax, um, you get a lot more tax in. If it's, if it's easy and simple, there's less chance of fraud or uh, misrepresentation of the tax, and therefore simple solutions tend to generate more tax. So we can't see uh, the UK introducing any more taxes. Um, so the UK would now be able to change reduced rates on some key products, uh, I think like domestic fuel and e-books. Um, however, it is likely that the EU will allow similar freedoms uh, for other countries as well in the, the next 18 months. So I think we was, one of the things that I do a lot of presentations on at the moment is the whole digital revolution and compliance around VAT. And um, I, you know, when you look at something like BEPS, uh, BEPS, which is base erosion prof, uh, profit sharing, um, it's nothing to do with VAT. It's to do with direct tax. But the point is, is that a lot of countries are trying to move away from direct taxation, and we're going to—I think—we're going to start seeing more emphasis on uh, transactional-based taxes. Um, any deals that are struck like to take a lot of time. If we look at how long the Canadian trade deal uh, has taken, and it was almost derailed completely because of just one Belgian re uh, region. Um, you know, the revolt by the Belgian regions could ha uh, also serve as an indication of the difficulties that would. Or could arise in striking a deal with the UK. So this is likely to mean that whilst we assume not much will change, um, there may be an initial uh, change to default uh, the World Trade Organization rules um, when, a, uh, when a change again, when a deal is likely to be reached. But precedents will suggest that EU will take a long time to get their act together for the UK um, with intentional robots. So continuously uh, used to um, introduce some form of uh, I suppose, of, of retaliation for us leaving. I think that is something that we will face, and I think it won't necessarily be straightforward, not because the process can't be, but just because um, most of Europe seems to be focused on making an example out of the UK rather than um, actually understanding the reason why the UK left and then just trying to make Europe better, stripping out the, uh, the bureaucracy that, that is there, speeding processes up and stop wasting money, basically. Um, so I think we're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, pushback in a lot of different areas. So any process could take a long a long time, and I think that's one of the reasons why you know certainly by default we're probably going to see 
a lot of things sticking to the status quo initially. Okay, reporting. Uh, luckily, the UK is relatively straightforward and simpl simplistic uh, fiscal reporting. Um, unlike other EU countries, uh, such as uh, you know, Belgium, Portugal, Italy, Spain, etc. And as such, uh, leaving the EU will be um, not too great an impact on reporting at all, certainly not for the UK. As I said, on the European side, we're just one country out of uh, 28, so you don't think there's going to be any impact on any of the reporting from your European entities. It's purely going to be an impact on your, um, your UK entities, unless, of course, you've hard-coded some of your tax uh, reports. Um, <clears throat> so we're, you know, in the UK, there should be no longer a requirement to use interest reporting, nor will we need to submit the European Sales Listing Report. Uh, but I do wonder, however, that with the importance of, this, of the statistical information that is provided by both interest at and the European uh, Sales Listing Report, we may still, uh, may still see something in place. And I think that's always uh, something I, I, you know, I think a lot of people don't realise around tax reporting is that it's not just about the tax rate, it's all the additional information that you know countries want to get out of the reports. And I think um, that's something which um, you know you may see uh, continuing, uh, just, just as, as a suggestion. Um, one thing though to keep in consideration, that after the date of Brexit, if a credit memo is created for an invoice prior to Brexit, the EU rates will need to be used and this may mean that some EU reporting will still need to take place for a time after Brexit. I'm not sure if they will put a cap on that. So, you know, if you were to raise a uh, credit, credit note that was for a transaction three years after Brexit, um, whether or not you would still have to uh, run a, a European report or whether they just do that for a limited amount of time. But that's definitely something you're going to have to, to consider is the fact that um, some European reporting is going to still be likely. So MOSS, <clears throat> um, MOSS, which is the mini one-stop shop, will remain and can thankfully still be used to allow digital sales to the EU. So anybody who's logged on from a, a non-European country, um, if you have MOSS in the uh, UK, move it to a country potentially like Ireland, register there, and everything will still work uh, perfectly fine. Um, in actual fact, um, the UK will potentially have to start using MOSS quite frequently to be able to uh, trade in Europe as well. Um, I, I think we are probably looking at a lot more change to the way taxes are. So MOS is primarily around uh, for the digital sales, but I think we're going to start seeing uh, a move maybe towards ultimately um, charging tax in your um, in the current, in the uh, the rate of your the end the uh, location you're selling to. So if you're selling into Germany, you may actually start seeing uh, the ability to charge German tax anyway, like with Moss, but rolled out, you know, in a much more um, sort of to, to cover more and more sort of processes. But that's not going to happen for a long, long time. But it's something that I think the uh, Europe will start to, to move towards. Um, so, as I said, I think we may even see a collaboration with a country like Ireland, uh, where the process will be made uh, simpler. Uh, as possible, uh, maybe there'll be some sort of union with Ireland. I mean, this is something I've been hearing on the grapevine, where you know we may be able to deal do something with uh, Ireland, where we can pretty much uh, process everything by them for Europe. Uh, they are we, we, we do share a border with them, of course, uh, a land border that is. We also need to consider all of those uh, non-European countries that are currently registered in, in the UK for Moss. They will need to be re-registered elsewhere, and that is actually something you can do uh, beforehand. So whether you are uh, in the uh, um, or whether you know Brexit goes ahead or not, that is something you can consider to do now, uh, and particularly with the number of potential uh, issues around Brexit you may have in the future, um, doing things that you can do prior to Brexit uh, could um, de-risk certain areas um, for you and allow you to have more resource available for potentially problematic areas. Um, you know that deregistering. Um, it's something, as I said, you can do now. Uh, what we may also see is the extension of the MOSS for all European sales. Um, I hinted at that earlier, but this is uh, already something in discussion that will allow a company to change or charge the destination tax rate and submit it under a simplified MOSS process. Okay, next slide is on tax recovery. So, 
The recovery of VAT is not going to change, uh, but how it's recovered will. Any VAT in the UK will be recovered in exactly the same way, but the ability to use simplified eighth directive um, is likely to be replaced with a paper-based and far slower 30th directive. Um, interestingly, we see many companies not even bothering to recover foreign tax even now. Uh, we're actually undertaking a project right now, uh, and we think the return on the investment on the project is going to be about seven months purely on the money that they can recover on um, foreign tax. So if you've got companies out there who, who are not bothering now, um, it shouldn't affect you, but I strongly suggest that you know you look into that because it's very possible to uh, recover tax automatically. Now, any of the simplified 8th directive will be replaced with the 13th. It may still stay in place um, if we have some sort of customs union um, to allow us to still submit by the 8th directive. Um, if everything's already set up, it, it may still go ahead, but expect it to change to the 13th. Um, at Innovate Tax, uh, we, we do have a full uh, expense solution that allows you to cover all of your EU VAT, and this method will uh, not be affected with Brexit either. So not being in the EU uh, may make the recovery of VAT harder for some countries, with uh, some such uh, countries like France requiring fiscal representation or the need for recipro reciprocity. Uh, so for example, the US cannot recover any tax from Portugal, and likewise, Portugal won't recover any tax from uh, the US. So um, if we don't have that reciprocity in um, for Europe, then we may not be able to recover the tax anyway. But again, it's unlikely. Um, there's lots of companies that do business uh, in the UK. So we're likely to see a fairly level playing field in that aspect. Customs and tariffs. Okay, so. Customs and tariffs is an interesting section. Generally, we do not have any uh, tax logic to handle, uh, any tax on customs or tariffs in Oracle, as these are collected by freight forwarders or the tax authorities and billed separately. So Oracle business tax can, of course, provide the logic to determine any potential tariffs, as it can calculate tax on, on any transactional-based tax. It is also possible to include a PO-based rule to capture the cost of a potential tariff on a purchase order so if the expense can be captured on your goods received and not invoiced, um, so if there's any punitive tariffs, for example, then you'd want to record these as against each of the purchases as they are a cost. So where um, you know previously VAT is recovered in full, therefore VAT is a, is a pass-through cost and you don't want it um, on your purchase orders. If you have a tariff that's going to add 3% to, to purchasing something from overseas, you may want that on your PO now so that you can actually uh, record it as a, as a cost towards your budget. So it can be recorded against a cost center rather than being put on into one bucket. And you can expect the same custom laws as the EU initially adopted uh, them over time to change to better reflect UK requirements. So whatever's put in place now um, is potentially likely to, to change over time. So something that's really important, and this actually is going to really affect your tax solution. Um, Timing is everything, as they say. So, EU legislation will remain until 12 a.m. of the last day that we're in the EU. This means that your tax solution needs to be able to handle this. What will make things uh, both interesting and very difficult is that all accrued rights remain enforceable right up to the last day, and the laws will have to be observed and will not disappear, so that anything pending um, can and most likely will be pursued. So timing can play into companies' hands. Anything that is most likely to be favourable under EU law uh, would mean getting your claims in now. Anything that is uh, where EU law is uh, unfavourable, then wait until after Brexit. So potentially expect your tax solution to have to deal with this. And what I mean is that if you work for uh, an international company um, and with the hard Brexit, for example, there may be a ruling... Um, that could come into effect that would ease up on certain taxes or you expect potentially um, some, some rules to change. That could play into the hands of your, your company. There could be some money saving uh, opportunities. And as a result, you may have to have a solution that can handle both taxes after the Brexit. So it's not going to be a, a clean cut, turn off your old solution, turn on the new. Um, interestingly, though, Parliament can intervene if they want to override uh, any tax rules, but this would be extremely unlikely. Uh, it would need to be an act of parliament to override the EU legislation, 
But this is uh, unlikely to be um, against human rights act and would most likely uh, further decrease relations with Europe. So anything that's in place now is likely to stay in place. Um, but what we are seeing is that um, EU law is also likely to be ref uh, referenceable um, a lot less now. So um, EU law is likely to be referenceable, but there is uh, likely to be a decreasing appetite in making reference to EU law, even now. Um, I've actually seen this with a discussion with my colleagues at the Fat Practitioners Group in the UK. Um, you know, there's an unwillingness to apply EU law by UK courts for fear of complexities in the future. So they're starting to tail off even now. Um, again, this shouldn't really affect you um, with your tax solution, but be aware because it could mean that um, you, you have to keep the door open, so to speak, for uh, EU law um, after post-Brexit. So what about configuration changes? Um, in reality, we'd like to see the status quo maintained. Except for uh, the intra-EU uh, rules, uh, what this means is that for the uh, UK tax regime, any sales to the EU will be treated as if they were sales to outside the EU. And that's exactly the same way as to the United States or to, to Switzerland. And for any other country, the UK will be treated as any other country outside the EU. Um, so let's split this between the UK and the rest of the EU. Those countries already um, outside the EU won't see any differences uh, in taxation when, when Brexit takes place at all. Um, obviously, the Europe is uh, sorry. If, if a US company is selling into Europe, um, it's all treated as importation anyway. It does not make a difference at all to a US company selling into the UK, unless of course you have a, a tax registration. But then, if you have a tax registration, the tax is going to be processed as exactly as it would be. For the EU tax regimes, um, simply removing the UK uh, from the EU tax zone should mean that no other work is needed. Um, we say this should be the case with the Innovate tax solution, uh, but that is uh, how simple it can be. Um, unfortunately, the majority of tax solutions that we see have been badly set up. So uh, you may have a solution that is one of those badly set up ones. We actually estimate about 95% of the solutions out there. So for those, those of you on this call, you probably have uh, a, a tax solution that defaults tax codes and allows users to manually override them. That is the uh, the worst case uh, tax solution you can have. It's an 11i solution. Uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's still the most common way um, solutions have been set up. It's a very cheap and quick way of setting it up, and that's why a lot of companies have it. But the majority of tax solutions we see have been barely set up. Uh, default tax codes, and allow users to manually override them, and this approach, uh, as I said, is known as the 11i solution. Um, a solution set up, this way, uh, we're done to save time, pretty much. And uh, so what would have been a five second change to a tax zone, if you had a fully automated tax solution, by just end date in the UK, you'll now need to manage all of your source data. So you will have to now maintain every area where you are defaulting tax rates. Um, with the Innovate tax solution that we have, because we build everything in and use all the tax rules, uh, we don't have anything linked to suppliers or customers, so the maintenance will be straightforward. There's no updating of suppliers or customers needed. But if you are defaulting tax codes, then you're going to have to go back and update every single customer and every single supplier um, that is linked to uh, the EU. So, for example, if you have uh, a, a French entity and you're selling to the UK, it may have been uh, defaulted down as saying uh, this is an EU sales services. Well, now it's going to be an export or an outscope, or if you, you know, even worse, you're turning the tax off. So, you're definitely going to have to uh, go through and manage a whole load of maintenance. But the interesting thing, of course, is that you're going to have to do that um, pretty much on the day. You, you can't, you're going to have to end date everything. You can't just do it, um, you know, a week before because then the tax is going to be incorrect. So you need to manage how you do that. Um, you're also going to potentially have to update all of your inventory items as well. If, you, if you're driving tax from inventory items and you're being a bit, um, and, and again, you don't have uh, tax rules in place that would make it simple, inventory items may have to be changed. Um, but there is a warning and a risk. Um, you, you know, you can change the data when the default tax rate will kick in, but you will need to make sure that the default date is linked to the taxation date of the invoice. You cannot enter an invoice dated 31st of March 2019 um, on the 1st of April 2019 and use new tax rates. So what that means is that the tax logic has to kick in based on your, uh, your invoice uh, date, not the actual system date. So, you, you know, in that situation, if you enter an invoice in on the 31st, of, you know, for the 31st of March, 
on the 1st of April, your EU logic is going to have to kick in. That transaction is still reportable under EU law, European Sales Listing Report, uh, etc. So we'll also need to uh, keep the old EU tax rates in the system. That could cause difficulties in selecting the right code. So if you have a manual solution and use the choosing codes, particularly in the shared service center, um, where you process all the invoices all over the world, if you still have the old EU tax rates and the user is working on other countries, they may accidentally choose an EU tax rate, um, which no longer exists. So we cannot end date them, as any historical invoices will need to use the old EU rates, and any credit memos in the future will also need to be linked to the older rates. So now you've got a problem. If you've got a, a, a dirty system, as we call it, where you're manually choosing uh, tax rates, then your system, your users are going to have to be highly uh, trained to make sure they don't choose the wrong rates um, because you're in effect going to have uh, sort of two sets potentially and you're going to need to keep those rates available for any credit memos in the future. Oracle won't be the only system affected, of course. Uh, interfaces will need updating as well. Any biddable solution or any bidding solution you use, uh, uh, any invoice scanning tool, all of these will need to be updated with the correct rates uh, and rules. Uh, that process them. So, you know, be warned. There are, there are, there's quite a few configuration changes, but if you have a, a well designed uh, tax solution, um, then the, the actual changes to the tax solution are very, very small, where most of the changes are going to be around, you know, invoicing, reports, interfaces, uh, things like that. So, HMRC. Okay. Um, interestingly, um, HMRC even now are interesting heavily in um, becoming uh, one of the most advanced authorities in the world. That's something that they, they really want to, uh, uh, to be. And um, I think it's something like uh, 1, 1.2 billion or something like this that they're actually investing. Um, so they're, they're making these changes then. Part of their plan is there's a couple of areas. One is that um, they're looking at um, making it so that you have to provide all of your um, tax returns straight from your ERP system. And so what that means is at the moment, I think it's something like 98% of all tax returns for the UK are submitted via the online electronic format. Uh, but 80% of these are actually done manually. And I think the HMRC wants to move towards uh, that full automation so that you, you don't have the ability to manipulate or, or move things around and that everything is pulled directly from your um, ERP system. So what that means, again, is that if you're doing that and you have that requirement, there's going to be extra scrutiny on uh, companies that um, may have incorrect tax. So if you've got people wrongly entering EU tax codes, you're likely to get flagged a lot higher than anyone else, and therefore you're likely to be uh, picked up on any tax audits, which you don't want to be doing. So that's something also to bear in mind. You want to have a nice, clean solution um, you know, that's automated and well-structured. Um, that you can move forward with, um, rather than just having something where you just hack at it and hope for the best. Um, something else which is interesting is that the HYC are looking to uh, impose penalties on those entities, such as your big four, that would have uh, provided advice on tax, uh, that would have led to some sort of tax avoidance, for example. If, um, in the past, if, those, if that advice um, was, uh, um, was wrong, and the, uh, the entity got into trouble, then uh, that third party um, you know, advisor wouldn't actually have got into trouble. So they'd be free to have gone as you know, crazy as they'd like with, with, with proposals on how to uh, avoid tax. Um, whereas now, if, if those entities um, who actually take the avoidance schemes on board are found guilty, then those that gave them the advice are also going to be guilty. So this is, this is really uh, an interesting area because it means that you're going to get less advice from the likes of Big Four uh, on more risky areas um, and you're going to have much more sort of straightforward tax solutions. Um, so that's something which, um, from a Brexit point of view, would be just add another headache. If you're going into Brexit with all the new tax laws and then HMRC provide uh, these uh, penalties, anything else, you may have less help from the authorities or certainly have to pay a lot more money for it. Um, the other thing as well is that HMRC want that streamlined, real-time compliance put in place. Most systems now um, will, will, will basically produce a, a tax return. Uh, a lot of you may be using a tax engine um, which forces tax rates back, so you've got very limited flexibility 
if the tax rate is wrong of getting it changed. Um, and what happens is that the um, the authorities now are changing to, to get it more real time, uh, so they can they can get real time compliance. So in South America, we're seeing electronic invoicing, um, where the authorities will soon be able to, you know pull the tax return straight from their own data because they have every transaction in the system logged. And so we're going to start seeing more and more of that. And, and again, what that means is that if we go towards Brexit and your system isn't able to capture the tax correctly, um, then you're likely to be flagged up and, and you know, potentially picked up for, for an audit sooner. Uh, the only sort of saving grace on that is you're going to be in a, in a pool with many other companies having a, uh, having a similar issue. Um, so we're going to see a lot more automation as well, uh, we believe. So, uh, yeah. The last slide I have here, I've, I have gone through that fairly quickly. Um, the last slide I have here is uh, real-time compliance. So, um, one of the things you may want to start looking at, I mean, we, we've actually built our own solution. Um, but um, when it actually comes down to your tax solution, this is something you can do to prepare in advance. If you're defaulting tax codes and you have um, uh, the situation where users are choosing tax rates, start looking now to replace that solution and put an automated solution in. As I say, we can help with that. Innovate Tax, we just specialize with uh, Oracle-related solutions, but uh, as part of the Tax Management Special Interest Group as well, we're, we're more than happy to advise any client out there on how they can make a change uh, to put a solution in themselves. But what you want is um, fully automated global solution. So you want to build a solution that is, uh, is, is global in nature, not individually built by country. You want to minimize user interaction completely. So users should never choose a tax rate. They should always choose information at least on tax rate. So no more choosing a tax classification code, for example. Um, design it for shared service centers. We see more and more of these uh, you know, uh, turning up, of course, with companies or moving to shared service centers. And with those shared service centers, you have language issues. You have uh, you know, lots of complex tax requirements that you just simply do not want users to be choosing stuff. Um, we, we have a product called the Tax Compliance Manager, but if you can find any compliance type tool, um, try and avoid the ones that are based on historical data. You want, you want the ones that are, will actually analyze your data in real time. Um, to be able to identify what is uh, going on with your tax from right from the beginning. So the tax department can then monitor it. So with, our, you know, with, a, with a, a good tool, for example, it will tell you what's wrong with the transaction straight away. You can then jump onto that transaction as a tax department. You can then get it corrected or get the user who entered it. Usually it's AP when the issues come in. They can get it corrected, um, and then they can um, then everything gets you know flows through the GL from from uh, the sub ledgers. But the if if you have a solution that is using tax rules to calculate the tax rates, um, and you can put that in now, so you've got you know two years for example. Um, if you put that solution in now, then um, what that means is that when Brexit comes around, you already have a fully automated solution. You can put the uh, the new rules in place for Brexit. The system will then decide based on the dates of the rules which ones to use. It will also decide based on uh, you know the, the tax rates which ones to use. And so uh, with a very very simplistic uh, process, you can then adjust the tax logic so that for your European uh, other European sites, you just remove the UK from your tax zone. That's job done for all the other countries, all the other tax regimes. And then for the UK, you can just adjust the tax and rules so that instead of calculating an EU sales service, it calculates uh, export service, for example. And on the AP side, sorry, on the AP side, you're still going to need to uh, reverse charge. Um, the difference is, is that when you're importing goods, uh, you wouldn't need to reverse charge those because the goods should be going through uh, customs. So that does depend. I think um, the UK are seriously considering some sort of customs union with um, with the EU. So we may have a very similar VAT solution moving forward. As uh, you know, people keep saying, you know, the one thing that is uh, certain with uh, Brexit is that it's completely uncertain as to what's going to happen. We really do not know. Um, I think it's clear to assume that. There are several countries within Europe that will do everything they can to uh, capitalise uh, and to, you know, on, on, on Brexit. 
and to make it as hard as possible uh, for the UK. Um, and that's more of a deterrent for other countries to leave. You, you see things now with Austria, with Italy, Netherlands, etc. You know, most countries seem to be uh, have, have some sort of uh, complaints around Europe. I think Europe needs to stabilise itself. So even with Brexit, we could even see other countries leaving um, in the future as well. It's unlikely, but I, I, I'm going to assume that a lot of that Europe will make an example of the UK. Um, whether they can or, they, or you know, they can succeed or not, I don't know. Because ultimately, ultimately, uh, trade will prevail. And if Europe is selling more to the UK, then we're going to assume they're going to carry on wanting that, that, that revenue. Um, for the UK itself, um, you know, if they can open up deals and trade routes with uh, you know, countries like India, Australia, etc., then um, we may see much more of an influence around importation of products um, and there may be different tariffs that we see as well, or different types of uh, transactional based taxes. But that's um, that's the, uh, the the end of the presentation. So thank you for your time.